week 41, October 8th through 14th, Spiritual Rants, and that's the podcast where we guide you through the Bible in a year, week, weekly, week at a time, and this is Jerry Rothhauser, your guide. You know, um, I, I was in Nashville, Tennessee last week. And had a wonderful time down there. Must be one of the headquarters for Christendom down there. Of course, Wheaton, Illinois would be a center for Christians. Anyway, a lot of publishing in Nashville. And, of course, country music. But I went on a Civil War tour. Oh, my goodness, was so great. You think maybe you've had it bad. You may have read Jeremiah and figured that he had it bad, (laughs) but you haven't been cooped up in the basement while a battle was raging around you. Probably not, anyway, and that happened at the Battle of Franklin, Tennessee. Kids were cooped up in there, about 23 people in a small basement area, bullets flying, uh, cannon, uh, Confederate, uh, rebel, yell, all kinds of stuff. Now, Jeremiah, what's the connection to Jeremiah in your life? Well, Jeremiah had it really bad. He was thrown into a pit. He was put in stocks and bonds not by his accountant, and just really an awful time of it. That is ministry, although it's not always that bad. I know I avoided the ministry because I had a feeling it was going to be really tough, and I didn't want to get into it. Jeremiah was the same way. You've read about him in Jeremiah chapter 1. Oh, by the way, we're in Jeremiah 10 through 25 for this week of October 8th through 14th. And I'm a little bit behind on Colossians, so uh, we're just going to do the book of Colossians, and then we'll be be behind next week, but we'll be catching up because we'll do 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. So read on. Follow along with the readings. You can repeat Psalm 78 through 84 if you want. You're in the middle or two-thirds through Psalm 78 anyway for this week 41 and Proverbs 24 verses 28 through 2515. And there, that will be on the quiz. But there is no quiz. All right. And don't forget, our theme is rebellion leads to death, rebellion against God. A relationship with God leads to life. We really see that in the book of Jeremiah. See how I did that? (laughs) We go back to Jeremiah. But, you know, he, he was a whiner. I don't blame him. But what we have recorded is his... Prayers. What are his prayers? Anyway, and he talks to God. That's how we know it's a prayer. It's not like Paul. I mean, those were great prayers. They're just different. But Paul, he just talks to God. Jeremiah, it's it's a discussion. It's not a monologue. And so he has some prayers in there. It's not in chronolo- chronological order. Um, But you have prayers and you have uh, prophecies and outright judgment and then some judgment and judgment (laughs) on Judah because he was ministering between 627 and 585 B.C. That'll be on the quiz, but there is no quiz. So um, actually, it was during... The reigns of the kings, Josiah, who discovered some of the scriptures, 
and one of them read and adhered to uh, from Moses, and not all of them, but some. And then you had Jehoahaz. Why haven't you named one of your kids that? And then Jehoiakim, not to be confused with Jehoiachin. And finally, Zedekiah. And you can rem remember Jeremiah. It's Jeremiah was a bullfrog. Oh, sorry. Anyway, but you, you know, obviously you can remember Jeremiah. Zedekiah is the guy who got his eyes gorged out, gouged out, gouged out. Um, as they went into uh, captivity. Remember the northern kingdom? The northern kingdom is already in captivity. They were swallowed up by the Assyrian kingdom. And then the Jews are going to go into captivity because they don't listen to Jeremiah and adhere to the law. Now, here's what stands out about Jeremiah. And he must have known that I've been saying the theme of the Bible is a relationship with God leading to life. So despite all of the physical problems that he had, you know, being abused physically, not to mention emotionally. It's the ministry. <laughs> Buck up, Jeremiah. Um, he believed that same thing. Life comes from a relationship with God. And that's why he prayed like he did and recorded it like he did. I mean, all kinds of frustrations. They had uh, a prophecy which was preaching from Jeremiah. And what did the king do? Threw it in the fire. What did Jeremiah do? He wrote it out again and gave it back to the king. And, you know, when you get to Kaniah, you know, we, we've been through this before when we were in Kings and Chronicles and saw names being repeated, it gets, just gets very confusing. And all I can say is that the more you read through, every year you read through the Bible, everything becomes more clear if you have a decent docent, which I hope you think I am. In other words, a, a guide. I had guides in Nashville, actually Franklin, for the battle. We went to three different locations, and they were houses. One was a plantation, and it was the, uh, the greatest slaughter in the Civil War for any short period of time, which was like four hours, five hours from four in the afternoon till nine at night. And the way they promote it was that there were bullet holes and blood on the floors and in the walls. And sure enough, I was there, bullet holes all over the place. You could see it had to have been just unbelievably gruesome. And blood on the floor. And Jeremiah lived through something similar. The, the bullets were flying at him. And uh, I don't know if he bled, but he was in pain from the abuse. But anyway... So is at the end of the kingdom, the southern kingdom, which we call Judah, we call the north kingdom, Israel, and they didn't exist anymore because they went into captivity, and that happened in like 581, well, actually 586 is when Judah went into captivity to Babylon, but Assyria swallowed up the northern kingdom, Israel, in 721 B.C. Did you get that? It's on the quiz, and there is no quiz. 
Isaiah uh, lived between 746 AD BC and Jeremiah, so this is later, not a lot later, later, but 627 to 585 BC. He ends up in Egypt. He says, don't go to Egypt. And the Jews, you know, at one point say, okay, yeah, we're going to listen to you. And then they didn't. And then they drug him to Egypt, and that's where he died. So remember what we said about Ecclesiastes, that uh, the Bible for dummies said that Ecclesiastes, the theme is uh, life stinks and then you die. Well, that sums up Jeremiah's life. You know, his life was miserable, and then (laughs) he died. Why am I giggling? Because it's sad. That's why. I remember way back when I was graduating seminary and got a gig to preach at a large church in Fort Worth, Texas. So I made the point that, you know, life is tough, but then when you get toward the end of your life, things should be better. (laughs) I actually said that. I can't believe I actually said that. It was about 25 years ago. So uh, I'm more than 25 years older than I was then. And here's what I heard when I said that in the sermon crickets <laughs> some older people who knew better you know we at the end of ecclesiastes we went through all those figures of speech remember about how the body shuts down on you basically did you read that it was fantastic all right back to jeremiah remember uh chapters two and three was a condemnation of the southern kingdom, Judah, that they had rejected Yahweh. They had worshipped their own gods. And then uh, there was backsliding that was condemned in chapter 3 through 6. There was a warning uh, in the gate. At the Lord's house, chapters 7 through 10, that gets us to our reading for the week. Israel disobeyed God's covenant, 11 and 12, those chapters. 13 was about his linen girdle. In other words, that's he was just winning, wearing uh, linen around his waist. He was condemning the backsliding of Judah in 14 and 15. He was forbidden to marry. Sorry, several jokes going through my mind on that. No, it's a blessing to get to be married, but Paul said, don't do it if you can avoid it. And Yahweh told Jeremiah straight out, chapter 16, 17, Don't get married. He gave a message in the gate, again, in 17, but directly to the king. And I just told you what his response was to that. And then there was stuff about pottery in 18 and 19 that Paul talked about in the New Testament. And then his persecution in chapter 20, chapters 21 to 29, were prophecies during the reign of Zedekiah, whom I just mentioned, who got his eyes gorged out. Anyway, let's get back to, like, chapter 10. Now, being a good guide and docent, not being a dumb docent, and I like alliteration, I would be remiss if I did not point out that in chapter 10, some groups of Christians, although I think the the ones who 
adhere to this are probably in cults. But it is interesting, I think, in chapter 10. Here's what it says. They are altogether stupid and foolish. They may have been talking about Christian dumb, which is dumb Christians anyway, and especially cults. They're altogether stupid and foolish. And when you're reading through this, you're going to hear stupid a lot, you know. I think there's a lot of moms that would take, say to their kids, "Don't, hey, don't call anyone stupid. But here it is in Scripture. In their discipline of delusion, in other words, their idolatry, their idol is wood. I think another version would actually say a tree. In verse 9 of chapter 10, beaten silver is brought from Tarshish and gold from Euphos. The work of a craftsman and of the hands of a goldsmith, violet and purple are their clothing, and they are all the work of skilled men. Now, there are some Christians that believe that means you shouldn't have a Christmas tree. Boy, where did I pull that out of the air, right? (laughs) But there it is. So, I told you, and now we move on. In chapter 12 of Jeremiah, I'm I'm giving you the, the highlights. You know, when I was in Franklin, I had three guides at three different locations, They didn't tell me everything they knew. They told what first-timers on the site would want to know more than anything else. So that's what I'm trying to do this year. In chapter 12, verse 5, If you have run with footmen and they have tired you out, then how can you compete with horses? If you fall down in a land of peace, how do you do in the thicket of the Jordan? So that's Jeremiah telling the Israelites, you know, if you if you can't handle simple things, you know, how are you going to handle deeper things? I remember preaching, uh, again, still, I think, uh, green, what is, is that green behind the ears? Wet behind the ears, I was green. And I was trying to rouse people up because as Jeremiah would be preaching having a deeper relationship with God or having a relationship with God, not just, you know, doing things rote and uh, doing the Mosaic law, you know, have a relationship with the Lord. So I exhorted the congregation and said, I can't even preach The book of Hebrews, (laughs) here. And I meant it was, you know, it was more complicated, too deep. And, you know, they weren't accepting, you know, some of the more simple things. Yeah, I probably shouldn't have done that if I was more experienced. And we had a head deacon who was not happy with me after that. He's not happy. He wasn't happy with me in general. Anyway, so Jeremiah 12, 12 On all the bare heights in the wilderness, destroyers have come. For a sword of the Lord is devouring from one end of the land to the other. There is no peace for anyone. Probably the closest thing we had was the Civil War in this country. World War II was a mess. World War I was a mess. But here in this country, the Civil War was... You would have thought, what could be worse? Now, uh, here I'm coming out on a a limb to say this. We're we're, uh, fixing, as we would say when I lived in the South. We're fixing for another gigantic mess in this country. We need to pray for this country, pray for our president. It it looks like, you know, people on both sides are just about ready to have at it, at each other. Anyway, that was going on, you know, of course, during the time of Jeremiah, they just hated him. 
because he would bring these messages from God, and he had to do it. And they didn't like it. They hated him for it. Chapter 13, this is why I did go into the ministry. I didn't want to for years. I didn't want to. And I was going to Charles Stanley's church. And I started thinking, "Uh uh-oh, I think maybe God wants me to go into the ministry. I've been selling air. You know, you've heard of people selling ice cubes to Alaskans, Eskimos. I was selling air. It was air time on the radio. It was air. And the next step was I was going to get into ownership of a Christian radio station. I mean, the opportunity was right there. Well, I started thinking, you know, we, I had heard a breach, preacher preach, and he said, when you start feeling restless, that could be that God's trying to get your attention. Well, I talked to the uh, college-age minister at Charles Stanley's church, because I had been teaching Sunday school there in that department. And he said, look for a word from God. He said it, a, it was a rhema, which is a Greek word for word. One of the Greek words for rhema, it's a personal word. And he said, you know, sometimes there'll just be a scripture that just kinds of, kind of knocks you over the head. So I went home, was talking to my wife that night, and opened my Bible on the bed, was saying to her, can you believe that at a Baptist church, this, you know, pastor would say something like that to me? And I looked down, and it was as if a scripture was rising off the rest of the page. It was odd. Okay, you already thought I was crazy. But anyway, I looked down. What did I read? Jeremiah thirteen, fifteen. Listen and give heed. Do not be haughty. I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> For the Lord has spoken. Now, I'm applying this personally to me. There are some believers that don't believe you should do something like that. I happen to believe that if it's in context, generally, in in the context of the Bible, doesn't contradict any other scriptures. You can't look down and it says, you know, go murder so-and-so. Yeah, yeah, no, that's not scriptural, but this is scriptural going into the ministry. So verse 16, give glory to the Lord your God before he brings darkness. Uh oh. And before your feet stumble on the dusky mountains, and while you are hoping for light, he makes it into deep darkness and he turns it into gloom. Well, I didn't want that. Verse 17, but if you will not listen to it, my soul will sob in secret for such pride, and my eyes will bitterly weep and flow down with tears because the flock of the Lord has been taken. Captive. Now, this is Yahweh talking to Jeremiah, and yet I felt like it was applying to me, that there was a flock somewhere that I needed to take, take care of. And then it goes on, but in verse 20, again, it says, Lift up your eyes and see those coming from the north. Where is the flock that was given you, your beautiful sheep? I was in the South, by the way, when I read that in Atlanta. But that kind of thing can happen. It doesn't happen to me every day. I don't read the scripture that way every day. You know, if if God gets my attention, fine. It's a rarity on a special occasion, which this was, I think, uh, because the college pastor said to me, You know, uh, ask God for a scripture so you can nail it down because you're going to feel like sometimes you want to get out. And when that happens, go back 
and read <laughs> the scripture you think God had given you. So I have all of my Bibles, and I have a bunch, but all of them that I use, I have Jeremiah thirteen fifteen marked. And even this past week, it was like, yeah, I don't know, I must have missed it. <laughs> and then, what do you know, this week on the podcast, Jeremiah thirteen fifteen is there. Okay, now to point out this idea in Jeremiah that God wanted a personal relationship and that the problem with the Israelites was that they were sinning and sinful. And that is what the law points out to us, Moses in the Old Testament. So you should underline this scripture. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then you also can do good who are accustomed to doing evil. Well, basically, people are bad, despite <laughs> all have sinned. I heard Hannity say that last night. And O'Reilly was his guest, and he agreed. Yeah, that's right. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's kind of what Jeremiah was saying in verse 23 of chapter 13 here. You're not going to change. Well, how do you change? We've talked about that already. You know, uh, being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Uh, being filled with the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit. Not quenching the Spirit, right? Not grieving the Spirit. That's how you were changed. Second Corinthians talks about changing from one glory to one degree of glory to another, like uh, chapter 3, 18, I'm guessing. wasn't in my notes. I think it's right. Jeremiah 15, 18, I'm close. If it's not, it's maybe 4, 18, 2 Corinthians. You can find it. You can do some work. I don't have to do everything for you, do I? Maybe. Chapter 15, 18, why has my pain been perpetual, my wound incurable, refusing to be healed. Will you indeed be to me like a deceptive stream with water that is unreliable? That's why I say Jeremiah is a whiner. And my name is Jerry, Gerald. So I don't think that's, uh, you know, a coincidence. <laughs> Maybe God knew I was going to be like Jeremiah in pain and whining, moping. But it was okay, you know, with Jeremiah. He had reason, didn't he? He had reasons. Chapter 15, verse 19. This one's really good. And a friend of mine pointed this out to me years ago. He was actually my one of my prede predecessors at the country church. I served four years. He said, Jesus, well, Jesus, it was Yahweh to uh, Jeremiah. If you return, then I will restore you. Before me, you will stand. And if you extract the precious from the worthless, you will be my Spokesman. Well, Jeremiah was nothing if he was not honest. He was honest. And we're going to find out in Colossians, you have to be careful with your honesty. You know, you can destroy someone with just being honest. And I know. <laughs> I know because I have probably hurt some people with just honesty and I did it on purpose. Then I became a Christian and, and thought, you know what? That's not a good thing to do. I try not to, but sometimes people are hurt by the truth, and that's why they wanted to off Jeremiah. Now, here's the key part of this verse. They, for their part, may turn to you, but as for you, you must not turn to them. Boy, that has helped me a lot in the ministry. 
there are ministers out there that just want to tickle people. We'll get to that in uh, the end of the Pauline epistles there, uh, the end times, that people want their ears tickled. They want to hear what they want to hear, right? And here's the formula for a good ministry is you don't tell them just what they want to hear. I mean, as far as you can, but they're going to hear stuff they they don't want to hear. And they'll get angry. And look at Jesus. There'd be a primary example, but Jeremiah, right? Was thrown in a pit, put in stocks and, and bonds. This one, in chapter 17, triple underline. Triple underline. Committed to memory. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Remember Isaiah in 64, 6 said that our best deeds are like filthy rags. Remember that? The heart is deceitful than all else and desperately sick. Who can understand it? And yet, what do we have these days? I don't think they understand all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. In fact, they reject that because they are sinners. And so they want to change the Constitution. They want to change the country. They think they can make things tolerable and blissful if they can just do that. They're not taking into consideration Jeremiah 17, 9. All right. If you do, then you're what we call, I think, conservative, but you don't have to be conservative to be a Christian. Uh, Yeah, well, maybe you do. All right. Jeremiah 20, verse 9. If I say I will not remember him or speak any more in his name, then in my heart it becomes like a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I am weary of holding it in. I cannot endure it. That's why he didn't want to go into the ministry. He knew it would happen. Me too. (laughs) I don't know if you've ever heard of W.A. Criswell. Again, why are we on a Baptist thing? Not necessarily, you know... (laughs) always having to talk about Baptists, but W.A. Criswell was pastor of First Baptist Dallas, I think for over 40 years. I caught him toward the end. And he came to my seminary, which wasn't a, a Baptist seminary, it was just a Bible school, but he came and preached. And he, what, whatever was left in him, and I don't think there was a lot, he mustered it all up, and I was sitting probably two-thirds the way back of the auditorium, and he was preaching, and his recurring theme was, there's a fire in my bones! Oh, man, the... The place shook. It shook. I'll bet they could hear it up to Oklahoma. Oh, my goodness. It was was a great sermon. What was his point? Same as Jeremiah. That you have to speak for the Lord. That was the point. Now, here's Jeremiah, the whiner again. Cursed be the day when I was born. Sounds like Job. Let the day not be blessed when my mother bore me! Exclamation point. Cursed be the man who brought the news to my father, saying a baby boy has been born to you, and made him very happy. But let that man be like the cities which the Lord overthrew without relenting, and let him hear an outcry in the morning and a shout of alarm at noon, because he did not kill me before birth, so that my mother would have been 
my grave and her womb ever pregnant, why did I ever come forth from the womb to look on trouble and sorrow so that my days have been spent in shame? Boy, that's miserable, isn't it? (laughs) That's why I almost didn't want to tell you read Jeremiah, but, you know, you got to get through the Bible in a year, and you have to read Jeremiah. So, chapter 21, Jeremiah is talking to Zedekiah, the guy who had his eyes gorged out, right? And so you can read more about that. Chapter 22, do not weep for the dead or mourn, but weep continually for the one who goes away, for he will never return or see his native land. He's warning them about captivity to Babylon. They weren't listening. In fact, they just got mad and took it out on him. Chapter 22, verse 18, Jehoiakim the son of Josiah, they will not lament for him. Alas, my brother or alas, sister, they will not lament for him. So King Jehoiakim, not to be confused with Jehoiachin, who is also known Jeconia and also (laughs) Coniah. You following? Need a scorecard for all these kings. Now, this is kind of interesting. I, I, I guessed this, and then I looked at it. You know, we saw in uh, Galatians, Paul called Peter. He didn't call him Peter. Well, he did once, I think, in there. But basically, he called him Cephas, C-E-P-H-A-S, which I said is like when your mother calls you on the carpet and you're in trouble, you know, they... My mother may have called me Gerald instead of Jerry. She didn't. My wife does that occasionally. But anyway, the Jeconiah, Jeconiah, the Je, is left out of that. And he, when Yahweh addresses him, it's just Kaniah. Why? Well, the Je is for Jehovah, Yahweh. And it's like, you're, you're not associated with me. That's the point. Woe to shepherds. We hear a lot about that. Chapter 23, verse 1. Because you had a lot of false pastors, false prophets. And actually, of course, Jeremiah was called that. He wasn't, but they'd rather think that. David, a righteous branch. The branch is capitalized in NASB, maybe in your version, if you have something different, what's that stand for? Jesus. It's the branch, capital B, if you see that. How long is there anything in the hearts of the prophets who prophesy falsehood, who these prophets of the deception of their own heart, and he goes on, how long? You can feel the misery and the pain in Jeremiah Chapter 23, verse 26. Chapter 23, verse 29. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer which shatters a rock? It is. It's like a rock, uh, a hammer that can penetrate and shatter a rock. Right? And it does not go forth void. Isaiah 55, we saw that. Chapter 24 is about figs. You can read about that, figure it out. Chapter 25, verse 8. Because you have not obeyed my words, what happens? Verse 12 and 25. It will be when 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, although they're going to be in captivity in Babylonia for 70 years. And guess what? You know how long they were in captivity? 70 years. And then you had Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. When they came back to Judah, we already 
covered that, but that's the 70 years that's talked about. And we'll get into that in Daniel. Also, they hadn't rested the land for 490 years. Every seventh year, they were supposed to rest the land, and they didn't. So, God rested the land himself and took the people out, and they couldn't farm. Now, imagine we've been in this land for 200 and whatever years, and farming, 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 uh, being greedy, putting additives, chemicals in the soil, then we eat, and it, it comes into our bodies from there, or the cows eat it, and it gets into their bodies, and we eat the cows. It's not good. Uh, we're going against, you know, the rest for the land that God decreed for Israel. But, you know, it's just common sense. It would apply for us, too. All right. Anyway, 25 verse 15. The God of Israel says to me, take this cup of wine of wrath from my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. They will drink and stagger and go mad because of the sword that I will send to them. So it's not just Israel. It's all of the nations are called on the carpet too. So they're in trouble. 2517. I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations to whom the Lord sent me drink it. Jerusalem and the cities of Judah and its kings and its princes to make them a ruin, a horror, a hissing, and a curse, as it is this day. They're called out. Did I point out that the sword of the Lord in chapter 12? I think I missed it. On all the bare heights in the wilderness, destroyers have come for a sword of the Lord is devouring from one end of the land even to the other. There is no peace for anyone. So there's that theme, even as back as far as chapter 12. We'll continue on with Jeremiah, and you will with your reading, right, next week. But I want to point out, there used to be, uh, maybe it still exists, I don't know. There was a, a group of very conservative Christians, probably, I bet this goes back almost 100 years, and their house organ, their publication was called Sword of the Lord. So you, you get the idea of what they were doing. Let's get to the New Testament. Now, you remember, right? G-E-P-C, Gentiles Eat Popcorn, General Electric Power Company, whatever you use, there's more. To remember those four short books that are together in the canon. So you can remember that, or you can put tabs on your Bible and find where those books are. We've already taken... Uh, you looked at Galatians, and then Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians were all written when Paul was in prison, and Philemon also. Is that amazing? Why did he write Colossians? Well, I wrote, I read something that was a commentary and said, we don't know what he was writing about. I think we do. And actually, that commentary is written by unbelievers. So sometimes, you know, you read stuff that you know they don't believe in God or Christ. And they write some, you know, kind of silly stuff. You know, like Isaiah wasn't written by just one Isaiah. There were three. Then I read Jeremiah that all of it wasn't written from Jeremiah. It's interspersed with some guys that weren't Jeremiah. I had never heard that before until like last night when I was reading it. I don't know where it came from. 
Anyway, Colossians, I think we know what the heresy was. It was the same as what First John was written about by the Apostle John. It's Gnosticism. In fact, we still see Gnosticism now in like some uh, movies, you know, uh, not mentioning Tom Hanks, but some stuff, you know, even now there's Gnosticism out there. My son, and I think I've already told you this, and but, you know, I want to brag on him again. He was young in eighth grade, seventh grade, I think. His teacher wanted him to read um, Jonathan Livingston Seagull and critique it. Well, he had just pulled one of my books off the shelf on church history and <laughs> for college, at least. And he had read that. And he said, that's Gnosticism, <laughs> the, the early church heresy of Gnosticism. Now, part of Gnosticism, you have, I think he got an A on that. In fact, I think the teacher who's a believer uh, quit assigning that after a number of years. He doesn't have your students read it anymore, so that was a good thing. Um, the idea is you can get secret knowledge. And part of that is that there are beings... And this is either like, uh, I guess, Jehovah's Witnesses, I think, more than Mormons, that they believe something like this. It's Arianism, the ancient heresy of Arianism, where you have beings, intermediaries, who aren't just human. They're a little higher than human and a little below God. They put Jesus in that category. Anyway, Paul wanted to write so that people wouldn't misunderstand that. And so that sheds a lot of light on the book of Colossians and helps us understand it. So here is like the big deal in regards to Jesus. He was the God man. You ever heard that? I hope so. Because he was. He was 100% God, and he was 100% man. He was a God-man. So he had to represent mankind. If he was going to die for our sins, he had to be a representative of us. So he was virgin-born and a man on earth. He was also God. His father was deity, was Yahweh was God, God the Father. All right. So he had to be a God-man to be a sacrifice for us. So that's basically a lot of the theology in the book of Colossians. And then one of these books, why do I read crazy books? I don't know, because... It's kind of interesting to, to see what unbelievers come up with. But what they were saying is about the book of uh, Colossians. It probably wasn't even written by Paul because he's shifted emphasis <laughs> from the earlier books. Boy, I'd never heard that before, but that's what it said. <laughs> but I don't I don't believe it. I think Colossians was written by Paul and whatever he said in there is consistent with Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Romans, Corinthians, both of them. Anyway, here's what he said about Jesus in chapter 1. Uh, well, verse 15, it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous hymn in praise of God. But a little bit before that, we back it up, is a prayer for this reason also. Remember, Ephesians had two prayers in it, only one in Colossians. And it's like a monologue. Instead, in 
contrary to the way Jeremiah expressed himself with a dialogue between him and Yahweh. He says, Since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And if you think that's a mouthful, you should see the original in the Greek because it continues on. Strengthening with all power, according to his glorious might, for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Wow. Is that amazing? could take that on a desert island right and just study that probably until the lord comes back but here's the hymn in 15 and following he's the image of the invisible god the firstborn of all creation by him all things were created in the heavens and on earth visible and invisible he's a creator like john said in one Chapter 1, 1. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Now that's what the Bible's about, Genesis to Revelation. And when we get to Revelation, we see he's in place and he's the ruler of the cosmos, of the world, the earth, everything. He's before all things. In him, all things hold together. Now, think about that for like a split second. In him, all things hold together. So you're driving your car and going to work, and you hear a rattle. Jesus is keeping that bolt in in the place. Now, you should pay attention to it and get it fixed. If you have, you know, a good car with stability and integrity. It's holding together because Jesus is holding it together. Think about that. That's mind-blowing, I think, especially with the cars that, you know, I've been driving. He's also head of the body, the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. That's what I just said. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. So he's completely, thoroughly God. And through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven heaven. So, in church history, they had these documents, a lot of them written by Paul, but of course, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Peter, (laughs) the book of Hebrews. They had these documents, And they had to iron things out over time. It was like, well, you know, what do we believe? What should we believe? And most of them came to the same conclusion. You had some people who took differing uh, sides on things. There were factions. They would get together for councils. And talk about things, iron it out. Well, here's one of the things they had to iron out. It was like, it looks like Christ is 100% God, and it looks like he's 100% man. How does that work out? You know, some people were like, well, his arms are this much, and his spirit is that much, and... 
they didn't quite say it like that, but, you know, they were trying to figure it out. You know, how could it be 100% and 100% the other? Here's what they did, which was kind of smart, um, clever. All they said was, we don't know. You know we're just going to say what it is. He's 100% God and he's 100% man. And we leave it at that. We're not going to figure it out beyond that. I, that was a good solution. And the important thing about that was that he wasn't Aryan in the sense he's not a being that's less than God and greater than a man. He's not. He's completely God and completely man. That's why the aforementioned is a cult. <laughs> All right, so Paul moves on. We're still in chapter one. Although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, Paul had said something similar in Ephesians, verse 22, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Now, in that book, Ephesians, the theme was the church. So Paul was talking about Gentiles and Jews coming together in the church. He was also talking about us being desperately uh, corrupt like Jeremiah said in 17.9. And here, that's basically what he's saying. We're evil. We do bad stuff. And and I don't know if you realize this, but usually when I teach this, it, it boggles people's minds. Unbelievers cannot please God in anything they do. So if you're a billionaire and you build a hospital in Jamaica or whatever, Ethiopia, Africa, Columbia, Newark, New Jersey, it doesn't matter. That has no standing with God unless you have faith in him. And then it's only that you do things in the power of the Holy Spirit that please him in faith. In chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, it tells you how to live your Christian life. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. That's what I was just saying. You know, have faith. So if you got saved by faith, we call that justification, or a point in time you get saved then you live that way on earth. You don't have to worry about it. You know, once you go to heaven, you'll be fine. You have a new body, your environment's changed. But now on earth, this is a double underlining couple of scriptures, maybe triple. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. It's by faith. Verse 7, that's how we live, by faith. Remember Galatians 2.20? If not, look it up. Having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed by Paul and other teachers, in, in fact, I didn't mention Epaphras. <laughs> I should have. Epaphras is an acquaintance of Paul, and he went to Colossae. Paul hadn't been there. Epaphras started the church there, and so he comes up in this letter, a friend of Paul. Just as you were instructed, I'm sure it was by Epaphras, and he was instructed, according to Paul, and overflowing with gratitude. Oh, that smarts a little bit because I'm a Jeremiah and I'm a whiner and I complain. <laughs> and yet over and over and over in the New Testament, what's it say? Like in Philippians, what was the theme? Joy. 
be joyous, give thanks, Ephesians, right? Overflowing with gratitude. So I was out walking the other day with my new headphones, wireless. They're cool and practical. So I was out walking and listening to scripture, Colossians actually, and started thinking I need to give thanks to things. Well, I gave thanks for the headphones because they're cool. And then um, my eyes, I could see, even though I have floaters or like spiders dancing in front of my eyes because I'm old. It was a bright, gorgeous blue sky out and just wonderful to see the the floaters disappear disappeared the 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 branches on the the tree that God had created looked good i was actually walking and getting healthier i had all kinds of things to give thanks and i haven't even mentioned my wife you had to meet her sometime you'd love her i did okay colossians 2 wait where am i going so far uh a field. And I actually was walking by a field. All right, chapter 2, verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men. In other words, Gnosticism. But most philosophy is screwy. <laughs> That's why we go to theology. According to the elementary principles of the world rather than the according than according to Christ. The elementary principles in Gnosticism probably refers to materialism. And so they had like two wrong views of the material world. One was it was bad and the other it's okay to indulge. <laughs> Figure that one out. In him, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in him, you have been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. The fullness of deity. So he was fully God and then in bodily form. He was 100% man. So we talked about that. He gets into circumcision because he has to. You know, that that was the reigning messed up theology of the time, is bringing that in from Judaism. And he says, you've been circumcised with the circumcision that wasn't made with hands, or the removal of body of the flesh, but by the circumcision of Christ. So same thing that Jeremiah is talking about is your... Inner self is what's important. And then he goes on, read that, and we'll get to chapter 3. Now remember, most of Paul starts with theology in his letters and then ends up in application. It's usually like half and half, but not always, like Romans through 8. Um, and then he got more application after that actually to 12 <laughs> through chapter 12 and then 12 was the practical application and um, Galatians I think the practical started with the Holy Spirit in chapter 5 uh, Ephesians obviously he was th uh, theological in 1, 2, and 3 4, 5, and 6 application. You get the idea. So here, chapter 3. Same in uh, Philippians, I think, first two, last two. And now we're in Colossians, first two, and then three. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above. That's pretty practical. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. I can't believe it, but there's a theology floating around amongst even people that believe mostly like I do, that Christ is seated already on the throne of David. Uh, no, he's at the right hand of God. 
<laughs> That'll happen at the millennium. He'll be on the throne of David. Not now. Chapter 3, verse 2, Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on earth. For if you, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God, when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. That's memorizable. Just fantastic. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. There it is again, gratitude. Now, I think the way I look at guidance, that there's three, and I've talked about that before, three lights of guidance. One is the objective, the Bible, and one is the subjective, the Holy Spirit leading us, and then circumstances. I think, you know, if... You don't buck against circumstances. You follow the Holy Spirit inside of you and know your Bible. You're pretty much okay. So in seminary, I asked a professor, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. I think that means the Holy Spirit guiding us. And he said, no. I think it is. All right. Whatever. I don't know. I didn't have to say that. If you've been under that teaching, uh, uh, get my uh, encouragement on that. Verse 16, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, admonishing, psalms and hymns, singing, etc. We talked about that. It's like a parallel passage to Ephesians 5, 18 and following. And I think it's not either or being filled with the Holy Spirit, or letting the Word of Christ richly dwell in us. I think it's both and. We should know our Bibles and be led by the Holy Spirit. I repeat myself, but I repeat myself. Verse 17, whatever you do in word or deed, all do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to, to God the Father through him. Thanks again. We already covered this in Ephesians about wives being subject to husbands. If you have a loving, Jesus-honoring husband, shouldn't be a big deal, right? Don't mope to me about that. Husbands, love your wives. How? Like Jesus. Then she won't complain, I don't think, usually. Do not be embittered against them. Yeah, it says that. Children, be obedient to your parents. That was one of the Ten Commandments, right? And everyone's a child of somebody, right? So honor your parents. It's well-pleasing to the Lord. And then there's a promise along that in the Ten Commandments, right? Paul pointed that out. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Gee, it's fun, though. Okay, No, don't do it. Don't do it so that they will not lose heart. You want them to be encouraged. And slaves, in all things, obey, obey those who are masters on earth. I'm running out of time because I would love to talk about slavery, but I already have. So listen to the old podcast. And... Then masters don't escape these uh, commandments. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. My wife has that saying on her desk, knowing that the Lord, you will receive the reward of the inheritance. I wouldn't call her a slave. But that's kind of the gist of this when it's talking about slaves. Don't believe anyone that says that Christians in the Bible uh, think slavery like uh, pre-Civil War slavery is recognized by the Lord. That's, like, ridiculous. I've talk, talked about that. Actually, it came up when I was in Franklin. Can you believe that? One of the guys owned slaves, and he, not now, Civil War times, and his Presbyterian 
pastor gave him a, a book called, and this is what it was told to me. I can't find it online. There are other books with similar names. It was a biblical defense of slavery and I'll just leave it at that. It just that is wrong because Christians are the ones who freed the sa- slaves. Real Christians. I wouldn't call someone who had a slave is a real believer. They, I mean, they'd have to be carnal for sure. Anyway, uh, chapter four is masters. We kind of covered that already. Let your speech always be with grace as seasoned with salt. That's what I was talking about. You know, the truth can, you can use the truth to just beat someone up. Then you can look at the end of chapter four. You can see Mark mentioned there. Uh, Barnabas, Epaphras, I mentioned Luke is in there. People in Laodicea that we will cover in uh, Revelation. All right. Uh, Proverbs twenty four twenty seven. This had meaning for me when I was much younger. Prepare your work outside. Make it ready for yourself in the field. After that, build your house. In fact, and I think this is valid, a young lady uh, was studying the scripture, and she brought me that scripture. She said, I think the Lord gave you, has this scripture for you. What it meant to me is I needed to go to school (laughs) before I got into the ministry, which I did. Okay, Uh, Proverbs 24 at the end talks about a sluggard in his field. We had that in seminary to see how many observations we could squeeze out of that passage. That's a good discipline. You could try that. And then chapter 25 of Proverbs is Solomon mentioned because he wrote most of it. It's the glory of, a, of God to conceal a matter, but glory of kings to search out a matter. Verse 2 of chapter 25. So much good in here. I have it all printed out to mention it, but no time. Do not go out hastily to argue your case. Otherwise, what will you do in the end when your neighbor humiliates you? Remember, Jesus talked about to be careful where you sit at a table. Don't just rush up to the place of honor. Go to the bottom of the table, the most humble position. You remember the problem that uh, Euchre got into? (laughs) The announcer for the Milwaukee Brewers, remember? And he said, oh, they must be calling me up to the front row. Well, if you remember that commercial on TV, you'll be chuckling. Verse 15 of 25 By forbearance, a ruler may be persuaded, and a soft tongue breaks the bone. Great stuff. More great stuff next week in week 42 as we advance through the readings, one-year Bible readings for the year and move our way through October as well. You can find more on my blog, spiritualrants.com. They're daily. You can sign up for them, and you'll get a notification in your mailbox. You don't have to, and I wouldn't know if you did (laughs) sign up. But I think if you enjoy reading the scripture and learning about it, I think it'll be a help for you. And so would be these podcasts that are weekly, and you can find them. You know where to find them, right? They're on iTunes, they're uh, Google Play, and YouTube, and Libsyn. All right, Jerry Rothhauser here. Uh, It's been a blessing for me. hope it was for you, and I hope you'll be downloading again next week.